with you once again today and to share with you what where we left off from last week as we're talking about how then should we as Christians live and if you didn't get a chance to download this uh, this is an article that I wrote a number of years ago for our local newspaper and I'm using it kind of as a guideline for us for our talk tonight with you and uh, I hope that you will download that and make a copy of it for yourself when I uh, teach the Word, I always try to have a lot of scriptures that people can go to because I want uh, believers like you, if you're a Christian, to be able to prove, to determine whether we're, we're speaking the truth to you or not. Uh, the Christians, in, the early Christians in Berea, were uh, more noble than those in Thessalonica because they didn't just accept the words of the Apostle Paul, they studied the scriptures. And even as we think about the Gospel concerning Christ, it says that Christ died for our sins, uh, as the scriptures indicated he would. You go to Isaiah chapter 53. He was buried for three days. We're told that his body would not see corruption. It, if it had gone, been uh, dead for more than three days, it would have started to corrupt. It also talks about his bodily resurrection. Now, we have today in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, the gospel message spelled out for us by the Apostle Paul. And perhaps you believe that message but it's very possible that you could believe the message without being saved. You maybe are believing in vain. That would be a tragedy to know the information and believe the information, but not personally appropriate it to yourself. You see, it's very important that you not only know what the gospel is, you believe it, but you also apply it to yourself and say, yes, I will believe personally upon the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior in order for for me to be saved. That's the only condition set forth in the Word of God for you or anyone else, your friends, to be saved. And I wish you would keep that in mind because there's a lot of guys out there today who are, as Ron Shea says in his book here, uh, maybe you've heard some of these uh, when you, as you've you sat in church and the invitation has been given. Uh, sometimes people are told, well, say the sinner's prayer or come forward and confess Christ publicly. And give your heart to God. Repent and be baptized. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow Christ. Uh, make a personal commitment to Christ. Ask Jesus to come into your heart. Pray to receive Christ. Put Christ on the throne of your life. Turn from your sins to God. Make Christ the Lord of your life. Now maybe you've heard some of these. Well, which one of these things are you supposed to do? Well, the Bible is very clear when it says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, people want to add to that. They want to say, well, you know, I'll do that, but I want to add something on my own, you know. I'll promise God that I'll never sin again. Yeah, sure you will. You know, foxhole religion hasn't worked, and it won't work, see. You don't add other conditions. You don't make promises to God. You simply accept the gift that God has provided for you. And once you've done that, once you've been saved by God's grace through faith in Christ, and it's not of yourselves, then you're in a position to do the good works after you have been saved, as Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10 tells us. Now, what are we supposed to do once we have been saved? Well, we talked, I believe it was a couple of weeks ago, or a couple of days ago, I guess it was, that once you're saved, you need to be baptized to identify yourself with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, also to have a good conscience before God, and also to let other people know that you're a Christian. Now, if you were living in the early days of the church, as 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, there were people who were baptized for the dead. Now, I know that the Mormon church says, well, you know, we want to be baptized. In fact, I have a friend who used to be the pastor of the church where I uh, was out in California, and he used to be a Mormon, and he was baptized many times for dead people uh, so that hopefully they could, after death, after physical death, they could, you know, get a second chance to be saved and enter into heaven. And, of course, there are other groups and cults that believe that. And then there are some who believe that, you know, you've got to go to purgatory before you can go to heaven and nobody can go directly to heaven. Well, that's not really good news, you see. Now, the good news is that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again, and immediately upon, immediately upon death, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's what I want, see. Now, I'm hoping I'm not going to die. I hope that I'll live until the Lord comes back, and it sure seems like it's going to be very soon. Uh, there are plenty of indicators out there. Now, I know that people talk about signs, you know, the signs of the times. I like to use the word indicator because a sign, there are three kinds of miracles that Jesus and his, and his apostles perform. They perform signs, wonders, and mighty deeds. And, of course, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 12, it says, Truly the signs or the indicators uh, of a true apostle is that he had to be able to do these three kinds of signs. Now, keep in mind that there are guys out there today 
who I believe may be actually performing miracles. You think of the guys back in uh, Moses' day who were in Pharaoh's court. Uh, they performed miracles, but they were limited as to what they could do. I've even heard one guy say, well, in our meetings, we're going to see people raised from the dead. Well, I don't think God's going to allow that to happen until uh, the middle of the tribulation when the Antichrist gets killed and he comes back to life. And that is going to probably trigger his desire to every, get everybody to worship him. But that's another subject in itself. We better, better not get sidetracked on that. But anyway, we want to talk about, you know, what are the house rules? How are we supposed to live? Now, if you haven't got a copy of this one, I wish you really would. It's called Dispen the Seven Dispensations. Now, there are three major ones that you find in the Scriptures, as we indicated last week. There's law, there's grace, and there's kingdom. Keep in mind that when Jesus came, he came pronouncing the kingdom of the heavens over the earth. Now, this is what Daniel talked about in Daniel chapter 2 that was revealed to King Nebuchadnezzar. He said there are going to be these four world empires. There's going to be the Babylonian Empire, they're represented by the head of gold. There's going to be the Medo-Persian Empire, represented by the chest of silver, the breast, I mean the thighs and, and waist. That's going to be a bronze representing the um, Grecian Empire, and then the legs are going to represent the Roman Empire, and then the toes consisting of iron and clay is going to represent the revived Roman Empire. So we know that the Jews were, told, were expecting the Lord to set up his kingdom here on earth. And in fact, throughout the Old Testament, you have the prophets talking about that. You have even in the early days of Genesis where uh, the Lord told Adam and Eve, you know, that there's going to come a deliverer. And apparently Eve thought that, you know, her first son, son Cain would be that deliverer. And he turned out to be not the one who was the deliverer. And there's been about, you know, 4,000, over 4, almost six, well, 4,000 years or more, 6,000 years, I guess, uh, that of recorded man's history and, and time. Uh, we have about 4,400 years since the flood took place in Noah's day. But generally, uh, most... Bible believers who believe in a literal, literal interpretation of the Bible think, believe that man's been around for about 6,000 years. Now, some might differ a little bit on that, but, uh, you know, there's a basic difference between those who believe in the evolutionary process, and that's a way to get out of the responsibility that they have before God. But it's not, you know, it's not going to change anything. But anyway, I'm going to talk about the house rules. And we talked a little bit about uh, the house rules that if you don't know them, it's going to cause a lot of problems for you because in my Bible, there's almost almost 2,000 pages. Now, I have a study Bible here, and I would encourage you, as I have in the past, to get a good Schofield study Bible. And you can get one for, I think, under $40. And if you're interested, I can show you where you can get one. And it's well worth the money. It's like going out to eat one night, and you could probably spend more than that. Well, this will last you a long, long time. The one I have here, I think I bought back in uh, 2004, so what's that... Uh, Quite a number of years it's starting to get wear off, but uh, they say that a Bible that uh, the Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to somebody who isn't, and I hope that would be true of me. I hope that I'm growing and maturing and learning. Uh, I'm never going to learn at all. I've been in studying this book for over 50 years now, and every time I read it, I learn a little bit more. I like to listen to other people, and sometimes you learn what to do, what not to do, what to believe, and what not to believe. Uh, you ought to be just as discerning as I ask everybody else to be and to decide, okay, does the scriptures teach this? Because the scriptures are God-breathed. Uh, the original uh, Hebrew and the Greek and the Aramaic, they are God-breathed and they're authoritative as they accurately represent the original uh, manuscripts that we have passed on to us. Now, we told you that there is the Mosaic law that was given to the Jews uh, there at Mount Sinai. Uh, their law consisted of the commandments, the judgments, and the ordinances relating to their social, religious life. And uh, some people like to, you know, claim some of it, not the others. But when you think about the Ten Commandments, they're basically negative, And a person in a cemetery could pra practically keep it, you know. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, you know. And the purpose of the law was to demonstrate to mankind that no matter what he tries to do independently of God, he cannot please God, see. And every one of these seven dispensations that we have on this chart for you, it shows you even the millennium. When you have ideal, pristine, paradise-like conditions, you know, as the great society and all these people have talked about, you know, oh, if, this, if the environment were only different and all this kind of stuff, you know, man wouldn't be so, you know, that doesn't make any difference. In that perfect environment in the future, when Jesus Christ rules as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords for 1,000 years, there's going to be people that are born into that time. The first generation are all believers. 
But then they're going to have children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and many, and no doubt most of them, believe it or not, are going to turn against the Lord after the devil is released you know, at the thousand years. During the thousand year period of time, he's bound in the abyss uh, for that thousand years, so he's not going to be able to bother people. No more of this stuff. Well, the devil, the devil made me do it. And the world system isn't going to be there that he devised to control the sin nature. The only thing that man is going to have is the sin nature, and even that is going to be curbed by virtue of the fact that every need of man is going to be met. See, uh, you know, I, talk, I heard a guy the other day. He was talking about, you know, if somebody asks you for for your cloak, give him your cloak also. You know, uh, and the millennial conditions are going to be quite different than they are today. So anyway, if you try to grow spiritually, now, by the way, I should say this, even if you don't agree with this particular uh, chart that we have, it's not original with me, I just kind of compiled it to try to help Christians understand, you know, okay, what are the rules for our living? Even if you don't agree with this, the basic thing that you must agree with is you must have the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. That is absolutely essential. And I hope that as a result of your reading the Bible in a normal, historical, literal interpretation, that you'll come to a realization that this is basically the way it works out. See, Now, I realize that some who hold to that way of interpreting the Bible, sometimes we have a little diff some slight differences as far as the, the future chronology is concerned. That's not a, that, that big of a deal, you know. I think that there are going to be some people who believe that Christians are going to go part way through the tribulation or even to the end of the tribulation. I think there are going to be people in heaven like that. You know, they're going to be surprised when they get caught up with the rest of us when the Lord comes back. And by the way, we don't set dates. You know, what's happening here is going to be happening here with the eclipse and all that kind of stuff. I was just reading an article by Dr. Colbert and of, uh, formerly of the Faith Baptist Bible College, and he was talking about those like Harold Camping who set dates. I wish they'd had it happen back in, on um, May 21st. That's my anniversary uh, to my lovely wife. And, but it didn't happen, see. And that kind of a guy causes other people to mock us as Christians. We do not know when the Lord is going to come back, folks. But we do believe he's going to come back, and he's going to, first of all, He's going to catch up the true believers from the day of Pentecost all the way down to the rapture. He's going to catch up those people, not the Old Testament believers. They get resurrected at a different time. We told you about five different resurrections, and you can go to one of our previous uh, uh, videos here on the, on the Internet, and you can check that out. There are five resurrections that the Scriptures mention. Well, anyway, if you want to grow spiritually, you need to understand that all of the Bible is for you, but not all of the Bible is addressed to you. And we suggest and believe that the rules for us today are found, as, as Christians, they're found generally between John 13 and Revelation chapter 3. Now, I said generally, please don't, you know, because, um, in fact, uh, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You go to uh, Matthew chapter 16, and when Peter makes his great confession, he says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, then, and Jesus says to his disciples, Well, guys, I'm going to go to the cross. Peter opposes that. But in, there's a key hinge point in Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 20 when Jesus says, guys, don't refer to me as the Messiah anymore. And he says, I'm going to go to the cross. And that really got Peter upset. And he kind of rebuked the Lord. And the Lord turned around and rebuked him or actually rebuked Peter, who was uh, rebuked Satan, who was using Peter. See? So generally in that time frame, now we believe that in John chapter 13, you have the new commandment that is given to believers. And so that new commandment is that you love one another, fellow Christians, as I have loved you. That's the priority that we need to have. Not the unsaved people. Galatians 6.10 says, as you have opportunity to go to all men, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. So we pay attention, first of all, to those who are genuine believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know that there's some people who say, well, we're all children of God, you know, and, uh, you know, do that to all these people. Well, yeah, you should try to, try to do be generous to people, to be kind to other people, but don't expect the government to do what you're supposed to do personally. I get a little upset at these, what's called the red-letter Christians, and I'll talk about that maybe in just a moment here. But anyway, when you think about the Mosaic Law, it was given to the Jews at Mount Sinai, and they said before the Lord even gave it to them, he said, oh God, oh God, just lay it on us, we'll do whatever you tell us to do. They certainly did not. They violated almost every single one of those laws. It was a, co it was a conditional covenant that he had entered into with the Jewish people. And they did not keep their end of the bargain. 
and you go to Leviticus chapter, I believe it's chapter 26, as well as Deut Deuteronomy chapter 28, and you find out that God says, now, if you obey my commandments, these blessings are going to come upon you. If you don't, then all these curses are going to come, up, come upon you. Now, check that out for yourself. I don't think I have it in the notes here for you. But in Leviticus chapter 26, I believe it is, and also Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 14, talk about the blessings. Chapter uh, verse 15 and following, I think it goes down about verse 68, it talks about all the curses that are going to come upon the children of Israel if they don't keep the law. Now that's why today the Jews are in the condition that they are because they violated that. They did not accept their Messiah. And Jesus said, troublesome times are going to come to you. And in, of course in 70 AD, when Titus came and he wiped out the temple and the Jews had been scattered until 1948 and they're back in the land virtually as unbelievers. They're not, they're not uh, uh, yeah, they're chosen, but we're told in First uh, First Peter chapter two that Christians are also the chosen ones right now that God's dealing with. Now, in the book of the, in the book of uh, Romans chapter eleven, I think it's verse number twenty five. It says, "When the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, then the Lord's going to come back, and then after, shortly after that, when the Antichrist signs his agreement, his seven year agreement with the Jewish people, that's when God's time clock is going to start up again, see? and it's going to last exactly seven years." There's going to be three and a half years. First three and a half years, the Jews are protected by the Antichrist. He's, he's going to try hard to get the Jews to worship him. He's going to allow them to build their, rebuild their temple, offer their sacrifice and so forth, until the middle of the tribulation. And perhaps so down the road here, we'll tell you the chronology of what we believe is going to happen. But in the middle of the tribulation, he's going to kill us. See? Um, when he gets in a battle with the king of the north, which is a uh, reference to Russia and her allies. You can see it almost right before your eyes today. See? And uh, you need to wake up if you're dilly-dallying around, wasting your time on all kinds of stuff that is of no eternal value. I like what Howard Hendricks said once, uh, and I don't remember exactly the occasion when it was written, but it said, some men die in ashes, some men die in flames, but most men die inch by inch playing silly little games. Are you playing silly little games now? You know, you're so caught up in the things of this world. I feel sorry for these people, you know, that are unsaved people. And there's a book out that one of the guys, in, uh, a man who calls himself a pastor in Texas, and says, your best life now. Well, the best life now is for unbelievers. When they die, they're going to have a worse life. The best life they have is right now. See? But not so for the Christian. The best life for the Christian is yet to come. We all have aches and pains. We are in the life cycle. We're going to die, see. I realize I'm getting older, see. And uh, I talked to a couple people just today. And I had to go in and get a, a, a test done. And um, these people were much younger than I am. And I said, listen, I told them about our, my son Bill. I said, listen, you could die today. You're not playing. You know, that kind of, you know, kind of wakes them up. The other day, I think I told you, I had to talk to a guy. And he said, you know, my friend and I were just talking about that. Well, let me tell you something. You could die today too, right? Uh, James 4 or 14 says, your life is like a vapor that appears for a little while and it's gone. See? Uh, you don't have time to be messing around. You're going to have plenty of time to enjoy heaven. See, This world is not our home. We're just passing through, folks. See? And I hope you realize that we're citizens of heaven. Yeah, we're to conduct ourselves as good citizens here on earth. I'm thankful for the country in which I live. See? Seems like everybody wants to come in here and all these people, you know, well, if so-and-so gets into office, I'm going to leave the country. Yeah, they maybe they do for a little while. They always come back, don't they? Because we still, in spite of all of our problems, we still have the best that the world, I believe, has to offer. Anyway, let's get back to our, I'm getting a little sidetracked here. But the Mosaic Law, and by the way, in uh, Genesis chapter 15, you check this out for yourself. I think it's verse 15, 18 and follow. It says that the land of Israel was given to the Jews as an everlasting possession. These people, there are some so-called Christians who are saying, who are going in there and saying the Jews, you know, they're, the, they're the, the Goliath, the bully in the area. Just check a map and see how much of the world is occupied by the Arabs and the, the Muslims. See? Uh, they own... They, control so much of the rest of the world, see. And they're getting in, even into our country. But that land was given by God to the Jews as an everlasting possession, my friend. And they're going to get it one of these days all the way from the Mediterranean over the, to the Euphrates River. They haven't got all that yet. But they're going to get that in the millennium. And you better realize that. And if you're fighting against it, or if you go to a church that fights against the Jews, you're in big trouble. I know 
A lot of Jews cause problems for other people. There's a lot of Jews that just want to get along. They don't want to cause problems. But there are some that are really, and you know, they want to, you know, I think of this guy I mentioned the other day, uh, multi-billionaire. Uh, some have suggested that he's behind some of the riots that are going on right now in our country. And he's done a lot of stuff to ruin other countries and, and upset the economies. Well, if he doesn't have any future, and if these people who are in Christendom, who are saying, well, you Jews don't have any future as a nation, well, then what are they supposed to do? No, I tell my Jewish friends, uh, I had a Jewish friend, he was in his 90s, I pleaded with him. I said, you need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior today. You, get, you have to be saved the same way that we Gentiles get saved. You don't get a different gospel. It's the same thing. Paul said in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel concerning Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. Christ died for your sins as a Jewish person, just like he died for my sins as a Gentile person. But you have to believe in him. You have to recognize by, if you believe that, you're saying you're a sinner. Well, I don't know. I'm a sinner. I know what sin is. Well, sin is lawlessness, 1 John 3, 4. You're a sinner just like all the rest of them. That's what Paul said. Romans 1, 16. I'm not ashamed of that gospel. That's what he preached to people. See, And you don't preach any other gospel. You don't do like that, person, that young gal in Acts chapter 16, where Paul said, where she said, was saying, these men are showing unto you a way of salvation. That's the way the Greek reads. See? And Paul got so upset because he says, no, you, we're not preaching one of many ways. We're preaching the only way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Peter said in Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. See, You don't tell people, well, you know, just I heard a guy the other day, I know he is what one of these lordship in exchange for salvation. He did come out and, and mention the gospel. I very rarely hear him, but he did say, you know, that Christ died for our sins and rose again. But he will also add on to that. He says, but you have to make Jesus Christ the Lord and master of your life in order to be saved. Folks, in my estimation and understanding of that, that's adding works. That's the same problem that uh, is talked about in this book, and I would encourage you to get it and make sure that you're saved and headed for heaven. I, I wasn't sure of that for, for many years of my life. Uh, I went to a Christian school and I got deceived by some of these people in the reform movement that were teaching me that kind of stuff. And uh, unfortunately, some of my own relatives were, got persuaded by that until God graciously opened up my eyes. But anyway, getting back to this idea of the Jews, they are going to get that land, you see. And you better not be fighting them uh, because God's dealing with the church right now, but he's going to, the time clock's going to start up again one of these days when the Antichrist uh, signs that agreement with the Jews, and they got seven years. Now, I, if I have a chance, I'd like to tell you what's going to really follow up things in the latter half of the tribulation time, uh, because normally there are 24 hours in the day, but uh, some things are going to happen at the end of the tribulation that are going to cause the atmospheric condition to be so that you're not going to know whether it's day or night, and that's why Jesus said you need to be watching to demonstrate you have real faith. See? Unlike those uh, virgins mentioned in 25, five were wise and five were foolish. Well, anyway, uh, let me mention just a few things about the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount is part of the Scriptures. And uh, I mentioned the red-letter Christians. They love the Sermon on the Mount. They like to pick certain aspects of the Sermon on the Mount. And, of course, the Sermon on the Law is a legal thing. It's much more intensified than the Mosaic Law. But if you read the scriptures and no, interpret them normally, this section of the Word of God was written to Jews. It was not written to the church. You need to keep that in mind. It's for us, and there are certain things that we can learn from it. You know, you think about the Lord's Prayer. There are certain elements that we can apply today as far as our you know, praying habits are concerned. But the Sermon on the Mount was given to Jews in anticipation of the coming of the rule of the kingdom of the heavens over the earth, where, we, where with Jesus Christ would be the king King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It is not. It was never given to Christians. But they said, well, the, the red letters in Christ are more important than the rest of the Bible. That is not true. What about the what about the Olivet? Not the Olivet. Well, the Olivet discourse of the words of Christ too. But what about the Upper Room discourse? The Upper Room discourse follows the the introduction of the New Commandment. And so, in the Upper Room discourse, um, John chapter fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen, chapter seventeen, you have the Lord's Prayer. Not you know that's the real Lord's Prayer. But for 13, 14, 15, and 16 of John, this is the upper room discourse where the Lord gets with his disciples. He knows he's going to go to the cross. And he says, now guys, he says, these are the things that are going to come to pass when, when the Holy Spirit comes and the church begins. And of course, they didn't understand a lot of that stuff. They're still mixed up. And that's why he said, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, 
believe also in me and my father's house there are many dwelling places i'm going to come back for you so don't get all upset and of course until the day of pentecost came they were really kind of in a quandary as to know you know what was going on there but of course so that particular juncture so matthew chapter 16 and verse number 20 you have a, a hinge point and then also in john 13 34 and 35 you have the new commandment and so in 13 what he talks about there he washes his disciples feet he gives them some other instruction chapter 14 15 and 16 primarily are what we would call the seed seeds that are going to be developed later by the apostle paul who by the way is the steward of this dispensation of grace not peter not John, not James, not Jude. You see, the, Peter and uh, John write part of the uh, instructions for Christians, and so did James and Jude, the half-brothers of Jesus. Uh, James did not, and his brothers did not believe in him. You look at John chapter 7, verse number 5. They did not believe in him during his earthly ministry. But after his resurrection, the Lord made a personal appearance to his brother James, and he said, Now, James, you've watched me my whole life. You know everything about me. He says, Now, look at my hands. Look at my feet. I'm resurrected. And that's the point when James became a believer in his brother, half-brother Jesus. And we believe that's probably the same time that his other brother Jude, who wrote part of the New Testament uh, that applies to us as Christians. So I believe that's the section. Now, it's important that you don't get caught up with this socialism that these so-called red-letter Christians are promoting. They're very anti-Israel. Yeah, as I mentioned, sometimes there are a few people who are in the Jewish community that cause all kinds of trouble. You think of Karl Marx, you think of some of these other people, you know, they cause all kinds, you think of Al, uh, what's this, Solinsky or whatever, you know, these people are Jewish people. But don't blame the whole Jewish community just because some of these people are radicals and are teaching others to be radical. See, You know, I had mentioned, I think it was the last time I was with you, wouldn't it be great if a guy like George Soros and some of these other guys got saved? Well, the Apostle Paul was no real candidate as far as the average Christians are concerned, you know. But Paul got saved, didn't he? See? And he transformed uh, the world. He, he died a, a martyr's death, we believe, probably by decapitation. You know, so just because somebody is a terrible person right now doesn't mean he's not savable. See? Anybody can be saved who's a human being, not the spirit beings that have fallen, the demons, but anybody can be saved. So... You see, the, the Sermon on the Mount, the church wasn't in existence. Jesus didn't even mention the, the church until Matthew 16, uh, 18, when he says, I will build my church upon this rock, referring to himself, not to Peter. Uh, Peter's not the first pope. You know, Peter isn't even mentioned in Paul's letter to the Romans. Uh, somebody pointed out, out that the other day. Also, you look at 1 Peter chapter 5 in his, one of his two letters. He doesn't refer to himself as the big papa. He says, I'm a fellow elder. And you need to recognize, feel sorry for the people that are caught up in Romanism. They have all, you see, all kinds of stuff that isn't, isn't biblical. Uh, somebody has said that Romanism is really a combination of Judaism, Christianity, and mostly paganism. See? And uh, many people believe, and I am one of them, who believes that the church in Rome is going to be head up the apostate world church. And you see things happening right before your eyes. You can look around. There's plenty of indicators. I don't, I don't like to call them signs. There are plenty of indicators that seem to be pointing in the direction that the stage is being set and the Lord could come back. There's nothing preventing the Lord from coming back. And we're not looking for any signs or anything like that. Now, when we think of the dispensation of grace, now, on this, i am got to wrap it up here quickly, but on this sheet, you'll find out here there are certain responsibilities that God has given them. Now, these aren't all of them. But these are responsibilities. Now, I'd like to ask you to look up these things. Are you doing these things? Most people fail them. I hope you won't. See? And then what happens as a result of your disobedience if you don't pass the test? Now, you're not going to go to a purgatory as a Christian if you die. See, That's another invention of the Roman church. It's, it's not found in the scriptures. They'll take a little part of this and they'll add, build a whole doctrine around it. And uh, they just progressively add more and more and more to enslave their people, see. No, but this will give you a general idea of your Christian responsibilities, what God expects of you, then the failure of most. Every one of these disciplines to us, and you can learn an awful lot about God himself. I heard a guy say the other day, he says it's really the autobiography of God. Well, you can learn a lot about God, see. And God is immutable. He doesn't change. Now, he's mobile, and certain aspects of his character might be emphasized at one time as opposed to another, but God hasn't changed. God is still a good God. He's a righteous God, always does what's right. He's all-powerful. 
No, nobody can thwart him. There's no contest. There's no dualism. He's all knowing. He is a, a God of truth. He sees things as they really are. He sees you and me as we really are. You can't hide anything from God. He knows all the reasons why you do what you do. See? And he's going to judge our motives according to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. He's going to judge our motives. Now, he's not going to judge us at the Bema Seat Judgment. He's going to judge our works to determine whether we get any rewards, crown, or praise. And I mentioned last time, I, was, I think I was with you, that the great white throne judgment is not to determine, you know, one final resurrection judgment, whether you get into heaven or not. None of that stuff, no. When you die, your destiny is already settled. Yeah. Initially, you go to the, in, into the heart of the earth, into Hades, and later on, Hades is cast into the lake of fire where people go. You don't have to go there, my friend. Your friends don't have to go there. But they need to hear the good news that Christ died for their sins, was buried, and rose again. And if they'll believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they can and will be saved. See, I made reference to an article that Dr. Manfred Kober wrote an excellent article a number of years ago at Faith Baptist Bible College. And in fact, I put it on my post here. And I would encourage you to read it. Because a lot of times you go to church today. When you go to church Sunday, find out, do they preach the gospel clearly? Do they leave out the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Christ? Do they tell you to do all these strange things to do rather than believe in the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved? That's very important, folks, because your eternal destiny is going to be determined by what you do with the Lord Jesus Christ. You either accept him or reject him. See? There's one unforgivable sin. John chapter 16 and verse number 10. The sin of unbelief. That's the only sin. You cannot commit the other sin that was happening in the days of Christ while he was here performing miracles to which the religious leaders said, well, that's, you know, that the devil was behind that. You can't commit that sin today, see. I've had people ask me about that. You can't commit that sin today. The sin that you can commit is to die without Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Now, we need your help, see. We need you to push share, number one, because, you know, I'm happy that we had about 400 people, 400 some people stop by since a couple days ago. But if you will just simply push share, this will go to your friends. Now, I hope you're not ashamed of Jesus. If you're a Christian, you know, you may not agree with the rest of the charting of this, you know, things to come. But there's one thing that's very important. And that is that your friends hear the good news concerning Christ, that he died for our sins, was buried and rose again, and that they believe exclusively on him and they'll be saved. They need to hear that. And you can do that by just pushing share. And the rest of the stuff you may or may not agree with me, see about the, the chronology of things to come. That's not as important as believing in Christ. Now, I believe that you're not going to grow spiritually as you ought to if you don't practice some of these things that are mentioned here. You know, for example, the Christians, you need to grow in grace. You need to walk by faith. Most people don't. You need to be filled with the Spirit. People confuse what that's all about. You need to maintain Christian unity. You need to use your spiritual gift. You know what your spiritual gift is? Most people, you say, oh, yeah, let the preacher and the missionary do that stuff. You know? Most people are going to fail these things. It's sad. I don't want to fail. I don't want to be like Moses. You know why Moses didn't get into the promised land at the time, he, you know, just before he died? He struck the rock when God said, speak to it. See? Now Moses, by the way, has been in the promised land. You look at uh, Matthew chapter 17. But he's going to be resurrected. Now he's not going to be the big shot. Uh, King David will be, according to uh, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse number 7, I believe it is. He's going to be resurrected, and he's going to be reaching on earth. We're going to be with Christ, ruling as his, uh, with him. He, he's the king of kings. We're going to be his bride. We're going to be ruling from that city that he's going to prepare for us. Now, I know that some people say, well, that's not going to be ours to inhabit until we get to the eternal state. Well, I think I could prove that otherwise from the book of the Revelation, uh, and perhaps I'll try to do that sometime for you. Now, with reference to dispensations, uh, I'm going to try to talk more about the different dispensations that are mentioned here. I said I'm going to try, okay? Uh, because I don't know for sure if I'll be alive tomorrow. Neither do you, okay? But I like what this fellow said about dispensation. He said, a dispensationalist is someone who believes that God means what he says and says what he means, and that it is the responsibility of every believer to humbly take God at his word. You see, what we have today, folks, is a lot of allegorical interpretation, spiritualizing of stuff. People don't like dispensations because they don't get to interpret the Bible however they want to. But if you understand that God made certain rules for people in Adam and Eve's day, don't eat this fruit, take care of the animals and so forth. And then he said, in the, day, in the time of the conscience, they were to live according to their conscience. That was a disaster, see. 
And then they left after that. He said, I want you to scatter out. They didn't. They built that Tower of Babel. Got to change their language. And that's what it happened by the way. By the way. And by the way, I believe that the earth, the, co the continental shifts took place in the early days right after the flood. According to Genesis chapter 10, I believe it's verse number 25. There's a guy by the name of Peleg. And, uh, not peg leg, pee leg. And it says, in his day, the, the earth was divided. Now, when you have the initial dividing, you know, there's a fast move. It's slowing down. Uh, I lived right by the fault in California, just before I moved back to California. I'm back to Minnesota here. And, uh, but the, you have all these plates underneath. They're, they're still moving. They're going to move. And you talk about earthquakes that are, that are going to happen in the future. There are going to be some big ones taking place. But anyway, so you have, and then God deals with Abraham for about 400 years. He deals with the Jews for 1,500 years. That turns out it is a disaster. They reject Christ as their Savior. God is dealing with the church today, which was a mystery in the Old Testament times. He's going to deal with the final seven years of the tribulation, judging the nation of Israel. He's going to bring believers to himself during that awful time especially at the time of Jacob's trouble, the last seven, uh, three and a half years. And then he's going to rule as the king of kings and the Lord. Yes, he's going to set up a literal kingdom here on earth. And I know that some people, you know, well, my kingdom is you know, it's a spiritual kingdom. No, it's a literal kingdom, an actual kingdom. And we'll have to talk about that another time. But, and then you can read at the very bottom here about the judgment. Uh, you know what's going to happen. You see, the reason why you're judged today as a Christian is so that you won't be condemned with the world. You're not going to go through a purgatory. In you know, 1 Thessalonians 1, 10 and 5, 9 and Revelation chapter 3, verse 10 says the church is not going to go through the tribulation. It's not designed for us. And the reason why we say we go from John 13 to Revelation 3 because after chapter 3, the church is not to be found there until chapter 19 when we come back with the Lord, King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Uh, we've spent seven years with the Lord in His presence. See? And as I, as I mentioned earlier, I believe that's going to be in that new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, which will come down to the earth, be like a satellite city, which will be the source of light during the whole millennium. And the reason I believe that is because in the latter part of the tribulation, the sun's going to go out. See, uh, Terrible things are going to happen. Anyway, uh, I need to wrap this up. I run, ran a little longer than I'd planned to. But uh, anyway, we would appreciate your sharing this. You know, if just say... Some of you are in that kind of business, you word of mouth advertising business. And if you just got four people who got four people who got four people who got four, you go from four to 16 to 64 to 256, you go to about 1,000, 4,000, it goes on and on and on. You know, uh, I want to let people know what Christ has done for them. I want to help Christians if I can, as long as I can. My dad was doing this kind of work until he was 79 years old. I'm getting to, starting to push that. I'm trying to stay young, and so I'm vital and keep my mind alert. You know, but I want to share these things with you because I want to pass on to faithful people. And if you're a Christian, I want you to find other faithful people to whom you can share this, with whom you can share this information. If you're not a Christian, you're watching me right now. If you think you're a Christian, you're not, or you don't have, you aren't sure about it. I talked to an older fellow today. Uh, he was in the rest home uh, with his wife. Uh, she was 90 some years old, and I asked him the question. I asked a couple other young people. I asked a guy from Uganda. Uh, I shared a gospel with him, and. Uh, you know, wherever you go, it says, as you have been made to go, make disciples, make true believers. See? Baptize them, teach them. Teach them grace, truth. And when we do this, um, I want to stand before the Lord. I'm going to say, well done, Peach. No, that's me. No. And uh, I'm thankful that my family is with me, my children are with me, my wife's with me. And I wish you would join us in helping us reach the people of this world. And this is a great way to communicate. Um, as, as I told you, my grandfather was on the radio many years ago. His voice is silent today. My father-in-law, great orator like Apollos, he's, his voice is no longer heard today. My dad's voice is no longer heard. Uh, my recordings that I had out in California many years ago, they're no longer heard. This can go on indefinitely. But you can help us get this message out by simply clicking share. And if you like, if you don't like, tell me, write to me and tell me what you don't like. And... Uh, Sometimes I don't finish my sentences, as my wife tells me. But uh, we're here to glorify God, to make Him known. And we want to help you the best we can. But uh, let me pray with you before I wrap it up here. Father, thank you for this time I can spend together by this means. I don't know who's watching. You do. You know what's going on in their lives. And I do pray that if a person who is watching this is not sure of his or her salvation, that they would make this day the day of their salvation, and then not only be assured from your word,
But we know the indwelling Holy Spirit, once he comes to reside within us, he will bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's the birth time in our lives. When we become children of God, sons of God, and we ought to start growing and maturing as you want us to, so that we can be well-pleasing to you. We know we're accepted in the Beloved, but we're not all well-pleasing to you. And so I humbly ask all these things now for Christ's sake. And um, I commit these folks to you who are watching, and ask your blessing upon them as they are obedient to you and your word. Amen. Till next time, Salamah. We have